Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. I am so honored and grateful that you are tuning in. But I have to ask for your help. I'm going to pull an NPR. If you'd like to help the show, you can donate to the show at emmettmuckles.com forward slash donate. Or just visit emmettmuckles.com. Follow the link in the menu to the donate page where you can make a donation of your choice. Thank you. Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with Emmett Muckles. Today is a day that God gave you another chance. That's all you need. With a chance, that means you can progress. You are a billionaire. When your parents got together, they shared some information. She made something of that information that he gave to her. And 30 days after that inception, you were a billionaire because you were over a billion cells and you hadn't hit the planet yet. We are human beings. You know, we are people under the sun in the image of man. But our issues come when the being part, because this thing does not come with the manual. You have to figure it out. Sometimes you get misinformation because people who came before you didn't interpret it right. So it's a constant struggle. It's a constant journey. And the journey to, as I want to say, self-actualization is a constant thing. I am not faulting you for being human. I'm only loving you because of it. Anyway, that's out the way. (laughs) Today, my guest is Dr. Rob Kelly, who, so check this out. And I I, I really want to deep dive with this gentleman because he's a recovery group um, coach. He has clinical, he's a clinical outreach director, world renowned and addiction consultant. And he's overcome a whole bunch of things, homelessness, alcohol dependency, trauma, PTSD. And one, I don't even know what it is, which is MDD. But we're going to get into that. What's up, Rob? How are you doing, Emmett? Good to see you, my man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, man. You Let's go. Let's just start from the beginning, as I do with every podcast. What got you to now? Because you just don't come onto the planet fully formed. What got me to now was an, an absolutely miracle of God's help. Because... I was born in Manchester, United Kingdom, working class family. And uh, my, my problem with my mindset is with alcohol and drugs. That's what got me in trouble every single time through college, through work, through everything. Um, a lot of destruction and damage done there. But, you know, I took my first drink at the age of nine. Ooh. Uh, yeah. I was, I was on stage at the time with a musical family. And <clears throat> as soon as I took the drink, the first drink of alcohol was a half a beer. And I knew quite that there and then that's my solution for the rest of my life. Because wow. everything I was involved with, alcohol was involved, you know. And I was a church goer and I was a, I was a choir boy, but th- this was all my doing. And, and this is what I've learned over the years in a nutshell before we really get into it. Is God give me a, a, a billion dollar mind. My friend said, stop hanging around with 10 cent mind. <laughs> Because what will happen is you'll become a 10 cent mind. Yeah. And, and, and I remember that from like, I don't know, 50 years ago. And I've always carried it, you know, in, in, into my teachings and into my daily life because the mindset is phenomenal. If I, if I tell you a lie, you might believe it, you might not. If I tell you a lie often enough, Emmett, you're going to believe it. But mm-hmm. guess what? If I tell you a lie life real often enough, I'm going to start to believe it. So we need to surround ourselves by these people. And that's what I've done all my life. I surround myself by the people that are going to lift me up, not put me down. Not the beginning, though. The beginning went horribly wrong. I became homeless. I lost my kids. One of them I've still not seen to this day. So, you know, I had to go down to the depths of the depths before I would understand and take help. But my spiritual awakening was probably the weirdest of the weird. You know, a lot of people don't come back from it. A lot of people don't have the wherewithal to say, you know, I fucked up. (laughs) Yeah, and I and but it's me who can get yeah. myself out of it. They're looking for someone else to save them. I I see that every day, not just with people in addiction. I see it in my own country where people are just 
looking for a savior instead of looking to the ownership for themselves. That's a whole different topic. But, you know, I'm, I'm really interested because you talk about alcoholism and drugs uh, dependency. But, you know, in recent times, we've uncovered some addictions that we didn't know were addiction, um, especially with these little things here. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's, a, that's a major addiction no one's talking about. I don't recognize that either. So, first of all, I want to put this out there. Everybody has an addiction. If you say you don't, <clears throat> you're either in denial or you don't know what's happening. So, everyone has one. So, we look at the early ones alcohol, addiction, opium, heroin, and then the new medication comes in, you know, the stronger medication, uh, the loaded, and then the street drugs. But then let's forget about that for a second because that's a certain mindset. An alcoholic is born this way. You can't drink enough alcohol. If you become an alcoholic, the mindset is the same. Different with drugs, but alcohol is. The phones, the computers. One of the worst things for a human being is separation and isolation. Oh. This is where it is. This is what it's got us. You know, a friend of mine said the other day, hey, Rob, I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook, buddy. I said, yeah, you're actually plugged into the wall. That's all you are because it's not human contact, you know? And uh, in a couple of years' time, maybe five or ten years' time, they're going to realize that we have a huge problem with society because everyone's forgot how to act in public. <laughs> everyone's forgot how to communicate properly. I mean, there are some restaurants which will give you a basket when you walk in and your phones go in that basket and you sit at the table with no phones. They're taking a stance because that... I, I mean, you, you must have seen it. I'm a, looking around. I'm a people watcher all the time. And you have two friends with mum and dad and the, and the friends are texting each other. And mom and dad's in the middle and they're laughing and joking, look at each other. They're texting each other. Yeah. Rather than turning around and going, hey, I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. And God forbid if, if they lose their phone. I mean, the whole life is gone. I mean, what, what does it become to where people are not seeing this and not seeing it? And it's going to go on and on and on until there's an absolutely national, if not worldwide, breakdown from communication from, from kids. Well, behavioral people, we need to communicate with other human beings. Yeah. But you know, I've, uh, I was watching a program last night with my wife and something hit me regarding cell phones. I have, I have kids yeah. ranging from 37 down to 12. And the one that's like 27, she was at the cusp of this digital revolution but my younger ones, that's all they know. Like, I'm like, you guys get muscle atrophy because you're just so busy on computers and things like that. Go outside. Or I literally would turn off the internet and they're like, just live it. I'm like, I'm not turning it on until I don't see you for like two hours. <laughs> and that means go outside. You have, I, I can't see you around the house. Just go walk, go do something. But that lends me to another thing, which is, there's two addictions that I, I've uncovered on this show recently, which is sexual addiction and attention addiction. Mm. And I recently had a guest on that pointed out something so poignant that we were talking about only fans. And he was remarking how, you know, these women and these people can go on only fans and make money. I have no problem with that. You know, this is the oldest thing. There's one thing that people like is sex and, and pretty things or their pretty things. But he said, there's an, another consequence that's happening. So a person will have the money that they need, but they're addicted to the attention that they're getting. I was like, wow, I didn't think about that. <laughs> You know, that, that's another, I mean, this is a great conversation because this is going where, although I've done millions of podcasts um, and nobody's actually worded it like you did, is yeah, there's this attention. So when they come out for normal people, there's attention deficit and that really can control you. So <clears throat> I, I, I've worked with quite a few uh, uh, very famous uh, rappers. In fact, one, one of them's, um, one, in one of his songs he talks about, you know, being drawn to the lights, loving that media, loving that tension, mm. you know, and at the end of the day, when it all goes away, I mean, there's a huge dip to depression. It's, 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 it's like a drug. It's like taking cocaine 
you feel great for 30 minutes and then the dip downwards, you have no choice but to either take some more cocaine or go home and, and feel like you're dying because you're depressed. And it's the same thing with, with uh, OnlyFans pages. It's the same thing with uh, public speaking. It's the same thing with playing on a stage. It's the same thing as acting. And it just goes on and on and on where we go from a middle to a high to a low. And that's dangerous for the human being. Once we get to the low, suicidal thoughts will happen because of the way the brain works. No dopamine's flying. Um, neural pathways are looking for something uh, that's not real. So all of a sudden they go to self-sabotage and, and, and you, self, you self-harm or drink or drug or whatever, or depression or whatever you need to do. But yeah, very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. But yeah, we don't know it yet. Just like the cell phones. We have yet to come across that. So uh, you're, you're originally from Manchester, England. Uh, when did you come to the States? Well, I came to the States 14 years ago to Dallas, Texas, and I came for two weeks only. So there was a church in Plano that had heard of my program, asked me to come over, all expenses paid, Ooh. and work with their youth ministry. <clears throat> so I thought, that's a great opportunity. So from that moment onwards, there are so many weird things happening in my life, <clears throat> you know, that uh, it's just crazy. Well, I came over here, and, and the minute I stepped off the plane at DFW, just outside Dallas, I knew I wasn't going to go home again. <laughs> yeah, I knew that, that uh, I'd been brought here for a reason. Yeah. And it's the strangest thing. And the reason I ask you this is because uh, my wife is Austrian. So, you know, about every 18 months or so, as, you know, as frequently as we can, can't during COVID, but we visit Austria. It was an eye-opening experience to me because it taught me so many things about my own country and also taught me a lot about European culture. Mm. Yeah. The, where I, you know, Austria is, is kind of like this weird micro utopia. If you, <laughs> you know, that they, they don't deal with conflict like we do, they control their food, their people are pretty skinny. And I was just like, what the f- is this place? When I was like, there has to be addiction. I was like, do people smoke weed over here? Do you know? But there is a lot of alcohol, a lot of alcohol, good alcohol too. Because I lost weight and drank a lot. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's true. It's true. The European companies that anywhere um, is uh, America doesn't see the drinking as we do. Uh, you know, people out there. Right. Can you come well, forward a little bit? to uh, European countries, especially England, the drinking is rife. Absolutely crazy. You come over here, the drink is not so much. But then it's the food. The food over here is just so massive that <laughs> I put on 40 pounds in about seven months. That's how crazy it was. So, yeah, you see different cultures you come along. I mean, the biggest one I saw was police officers with guns. And the crime rate is sky high. You go back to England and the OZL is a wooden truncheon and the, and the crime rate is pretty low compared to here. Yeah. So there was a lot of sort of things that opened my eyes. Yeah. Um, what about addiction globally? You know, uh, in, in particular, in particular, I'm referring to what we would consider narcotics, which is substances that are, unnatural or processed in a yes. way to be so enhanced when it goes into your body, it does, it makes alterations. Yes. Well, but the war on addiction that the, the authorities talk about is not, it's not, it's just not, it's lost. It's been lost years ago. Forget about it. You're never going to stop it. The amounts of alcohol, the amount of the drugs that come in here uh, into this country is absolutely unbelievable. It's when you see the TV and when you hear the press, uh, times that by 100, and that might be the real number that's coming in. So you ain't going to stop it. I mean, from my, I've had to, I've, <clears throat> look, after I went on Oprah, I had some of the biggest film stars and movie stars and, and, and actors and uh, senators and all them guys come to me, and every single one was struggling because narcotics was so much available. Yeah. Um, it was just, it's a, it's, well, we talk about today. Everyone's talking about the, the, the uh, pandemic we have on. And that's good. The pandemic is good. You know, we know what it is. We're now to do. We've got some injections now. The epidemic of drugs coming into this country is absolutely a thousand times that. Everybody's dying. Everybody's taking them. 
you know, from the guy sweeping the roads to the guy making a billion dollar deals in the, in the corporate offices, they're all taking these narcotics. And people go, oh, there's no way. Open your eyes. Are you kidding me? Everybody knows somebody who's addicted or takes drugs. And if you don't, it's probably you. Everybody <laughs> does, you know. And this is the thing I've been trying to get to people. And it's like, you know, it's just, come on, wake up. It's a multi-trillion dollar business. No one's going to stop that from the high governments to the lowest of the low. There's too much demand. You know, it's, 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 the, it's the biggest earning uh, company in the world. Yeah. In, it, it's drugs. End of story. Yeah, I, uh, I was at a um, convention and they asked people to get up and speak. And I don't look my age. No, you don't. And people are... And they're like, who are you? What do you do? Blah, blah, blah. What brought you here? I'm like, my name's Emmett Muckles. I'm a podcaster. And the reason I podcast is because I try everything that is good because my generation got wiped out or damn near got wiped out. And they looked yeah. at me like, huh? And I went to explain, I'm a product who came of age in the 80s and many of my constituency is either dead or in jail or a large part of them are dead or in jail because of this influx. Let's fast forward. And this is a, a bridge to a quest to a question slash statement. You know, in the eighties, there was this legislation for drugs and Ronald Reagan put a war on drugs. I think it went back even further than that in the seventies with Nixon, but it really kicked off because crack cocaine hit the street. And there was a war on drugs, but it was primarily affecting people of color. Yes. So it was a war on it. Yeah. Let's fast forward to like maybe 2010. There's a new drug on the street that is taking people out. It's making them zombies. There's a couple of them actually, but now it's the government and, and, the perception is we need to get help for these people. Why are, why is it that our community doesn't see it as a single problem versus that people need help? Because if anybody's had anybody in their family who's been addicted, they know that they are not in control for most of the time, that that drug has literally taken over their mind, body, and spirit. They will, women will do things that you would never do. Men will do things that you like, that person will never do that. But under that influence, it alters your soul. Why, why haven't we, you know, really recognized what this is and that it's here to stay and that we need to put a program in place to help these people. You ready, Emmett? You sat down comfortable. Are you ready for this? Okay, two statements I'm going to come out with. Let's prove them true. First of all, it's a big money earner. You can't stop it. Secondly, there's no money in recovery. There's no money in getting people well. A pharmaceutical company can't give you a drug coming off drugs. Now you're trying to get clean and sober. There's no money in it. So where do we go? We go back. Who do we blame? I don't know who we blame. Who do we blame now? I mean, you're talking about the highest levels of, of our, our budget to the lowest levels, is it a brand? No, there's not a blame. It's too late now. It's too late. People are dying. And here's the crazy thing, Emma, is the, the, the figures that we're hearing right now are so distorted because I, I went to a hospital on a Friday and Saturday night and I was allowed to take information from patients coming in. 93% of patients coming in and 100% coming in so badly that they died had drugs or alcohol in the system. So then we looked at the records of that year who died in car crashes. And 79% when we went into medical records were under the influence of either meth, crack cocaine, you know, all that stuff. But they don't go down as drugs. They go down as car accidents. They go down as liver failure. They go down as heart attacks. They yeah. go down as murder. So whatever it may be, but you can always trace it back to a street drug. So, so when we look at that, who do we blame? Okay. I blame, first of all, the medical fraternity for allowing the pharmaceutical companies to take over the world. Because that's who really runs America, is the pharmaceutical companies mm. who give this, give this script to the doctor that's beneficial. This is my opinion, beneficial for them to sell that drug 
for a reason, I'll leave that open, then the patients who come to me who are chronic drug addicts, chronic heroin meth addicts, where did this all start? Well, my doctor gave me, and it all starts like that. Yeah. So then we feed down to the guys and girls having to go out and find themselves. So it all comes from the pharmaceutical company. And listen, I've got a statement. Look, I'm, I'm 59. I'll be six of this year. So I'm, my growing up was in the 80s as well. In the 80s, we used morphine for everything. Childbirth, cancer, everything. It was suitable. Why do we have to have a drug that's a thousand times stronger than morphine? Money making. Money, money, money. For morphine, it was great when I was growing up. Apparently, my mom had it for cancer and birth. It was great. Why do we need it? Financial situations and pharmaceutical companies have taken over the world. Yeah, you know, uh, I asked this to a mentor of mine back in the 90s. We used to do some work together, and we would... I helped him with some stuff and he would talk to me and, and just drop life game on me. And I was like, why can't they get rid of drugs? And he basically said the same thing you said, but from a different point of view, he gave me more input because he, um, he had been a heroin addict and he kicked it. He said, all right, so let's say you just leave drug addicts alone. That's throwing a lot of money away. I'm like, how is it throwing a lot of money away? He was like, judges, police officers, um, rehab places, um, doctors. He's like, all these people benefit for people who are addicted to drugs in some weird and sometimes perverse manner. He was like, that's just the secondary side of once you're on drugs, it all comes down to money. I was like, whoa. That's really deep. I used to smoke cigarettes. So that was the extent of my addiction. And I got away from it, but it's still there. Like if I go have a, let's say I go out and have a Jameson's, all of a sudden that addiction going, you know that I go with that Jameson's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So with that, you know, you, you, you established yourself in the United States. How did you end up becoming so popular? You know, there are people who are trying to get on these shows and get exposure like you did, and you dropped that hard science on them, man. Boom. I was in there. I met Arnold Schwarzenegger many years ago in the 80s, early 80s, but 82. Before he was famous, he just made a, a movie called uh, Pumping Iron, an underground movie. And he came over to do some shows, and we were lucky enough to pick him up. We, we was bodybuilders back then. We, we was, uh, he was involved in all that scene. So we picked him up. We took him to a hotel. We hung around him for a bit. And I sat down with him one day, and he could hardly speak English. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, 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 he come from Aust he's from Australia. Or Aust he's Austrian. Uh, but... Um, I asked him uh, uh, categorically, like, what's the deal? Because his body was phenomenal, so his mindset was good, you know? And I said, what, 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 what's the future hold? And this is what he said to me, okay? Like, I can't, like everyone's laughing, to be honest with you. He says, I'm going to become the richest actor in the world, highest paid actor in the world. We still started laughing because he couldn't speak English. Secondly, I'm going to marry into the Kennedy family. <laughs> thought, well, that's just insane. Nobody does that. Are you crazy? And thirdly, I want to become a governor of the state of California, if possible. And we laughed even further. Boom, boom, boom. All ticked off. So that got me thinking. I call myself the best addictionologist in the world. In the world, okay? And the reason why I do that is <clears throat> I'm sat with, you know, Golden Ramsey, the guy off TV? Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm using it because he's a good friend of mine. So I was sat in his kitchen in London one day. This was probably many years ago before I came here. And I always remember me saying something. And he said to me, Rob, do you know I'm, and this is before he's on TV. Do you know I'm the best chef in the world, Rob? Like, well, obviously you can cook really well. And he said, no, because I tell everybody I am. <laughs> oh, boom. It's like, really? So <clears throat> when I came to America, same as Arnold Schwarzenegger, I had three things I wanted to do. So first of all, I wanted to become a millionaire. Check. Secondly, I want it to be on national TV. The doctors goes out to 18 million. Check. And thirdly, I want to write a book. Check. Now, this is from a guy that was brought up on a trailer park. 
of, of, of uh, an estate. Like I know project. what you're saying. What's the chances of that? Coming to people go back into America. There's no way you've gone on TV. There's a bunch of people waiting. To, there's no bang on TV within the first three months that I was here. You know, it's all about the mindset. You know, quantum physics tells us that I could be, let's say, a basketball court. I could be 25 places at the same time on that court because this is not real. You know, it's it's all it's all you know, it's not solid. Yeah. 25 places at the same time on the court. Where do I want to be? Hmm. I want to be over near the goal. So when I get the ball, I slap it in. I'm the hero of the game. Okay. I can hear your audience going, well, how do you get there? Here's the answer. You walk over and you take that position. End of story. Don't interview, don't ask, don't report. Walk over and take the position. And it's as simple as that. What you visualize in your mind, you can hold in your hand, period. I've shown that time and time and time and time and time again. I get my patience. My patience, one of the patients we had was a, a movie star. Now he's forgotten about it. He was thrown in jail. We brought him out. We took him to the Porsche dealership. We said, hey, sit in that car. I'm never going to afford this. Take him to the million-dollar house. He's sitting in that car. We did all this stuff to him. So when it came back to him, because it did, that's how good I am. It did. Every one of them, 100% record here. Uh, his brain was familiar with that with that car because he's already sat in it. So the brain doesn't freak out, especially if you've never had anything. Oh my God, I don't deserve this. Oh my God, this is freaking me out. Because the brain has been primed for that lifestyle. And that's what I do with my guys is prime the brain on a daily basis. Oh, I, I, I couldn't do it, really. Says who? <laughs> People always saying to me years ago, well, I can't become president of the United States, Rob. And now today I go, really? Really? You know, we had a businessman running the country for four years. You can become anything that you want to become. <laughs> don't put a ceiling on your on, don't put a cap on the ceiling, man. You know, what else are you gonna do? I do that every day. What else can I do today to how far can I push this deal? You know, how, but the, this is what I love about my life today. I get to help people. Yeah. I get to stop at gas stations, I get to fill cars up and women there with like five kids in the back of the car. I get to stand in line and watch this uh, man or woman count the pennies out so make sure they've got enough. I, I give them $100, $500. We get thousands and thousands of dollars away every year. Thousands of dollars away because... Say that, like, say that again, man, because, you know, a lot of people don't understand this. I give a lot. I mean, I just give freely. Yeah. You know, I see somebody who needs something and I have it or have access to it and I give it to them. And they're like, that's, that's they're like, you know? how can you give it? I'm like, because they needed it. I don't, I need very little. Yeah. Yeah. Most of it is, and a lot of it is just want. And um, many people don't understand the difference between needs and wants. That's America. Yeah, I agree. I, I totally agree there. You know, you never go broke by giving away, what the Bible says. And it also was one of my great mentors. So what that means to me is if I stop at the corner because I was homeless for 14 months, homeless, everyone given, no one would speak to me, everyone giving up on me, spat on, poverty, all that stuff, abandoned. If I see someone at the, the signal lights and, the, and they're begging for money, I'll give them $20. And a friend of mine once said, you know what they're going to do with that, Rob? They go and drink. And I went, that's not my problem. My deal is to pass the money on that I can afford to pass on. What he does with this is de minimis. It's none of my business. Right. I, it is, if he's homeless like I was, I hope he goes to get some drink because he's probably going to go into the, in, in, into the DTs and die if he doesn't. Yeah. But people get confused. Of, Who should he give the money to? I'll tell you the answer to that, guys. If you put away $100 a month that you can afford to give away, you give it to anybody and everybody because God will put in front of you who you need in so many different disguises, you will not even believe it. So you can't say, oh, I'm going to be the judge of who I give my money to. How dare you? Ain't your money for a start. People will be put in front of you and you give them money from their heart. What they do with it is none of your concern. And that's your job done. And I'll say something else. If you're feeling a little bit selfish there, guys, when I say thank you to somebody or give somebody some money, dopamine is released into my brain. It's a win-win situation. That's what life's all about. Stop judging people. Oh, look at him. You know, I bet he's just doing that for a scam. Does it matter? Does it really matter? Do you think if that guy had a six-figure income, He's going to stand on the corner with that sign 
in the pouring rain, dripping, freezing, shaking to death, if he had a proper job or he didn't have to, you think he'd stand there and do that? The answer is no. So he's there for a reason, and you stop at that red signal light right next to him for a reason. And when you start to see this and understand it, your life will take on a new meaning because that's what it's all about. It's not about the latest car. It's not about the biggest house. It's about who's going to be put in front of you today, guys. I'm talking about today who you can help. And you want to sit there and wonder what he's going to do with your $10? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Give it to the guy. And your life will be amazing. You know what's funny, man? Um, I've seen a lot of stuff, and it's because I tried. I tr- I was like, all I can do is fail. People laughed at me because I'm kind of, in certain aspects of my life, I'm obviously nerdy and not very current. But I can be. It's just I choose not to be. And I realized something a long time ago. And came up with this kind of saying that I teach people because I, I'm actually a coach, ment- an executive coach and mentor and trainer. And I talk to a lot of young people or people younger than me. So that's not hard to get. And I said, I asked this question. Hey, guys, if you're in a track meet, what's one of the founding rules that you have to observe to win the race? Everybody says, without fail, come in first. And I say, yeah, but there's something you have to do before that. Or you won't, you can come in first and it won't matter. They're like, I fucking understand. What what are you talking about? I'm like, stay in your lane. Yes. Because if you go in somebody else's lane, they disqualify you. Yes. I'm like, the other thing is, don't keep looking at the other lanes because it's going to slow you down. Stay in your lane and progress forward. And I have this moment of like 10 seconds where everybody's like, yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's your drop. It's it's true. It's still true. Everyone's worried about the next door neighbor. Everyone's wearing the Lucci. What makes me laugh is you see that all these people now with, with uh, Louis Vuitton bags Mm -hmm. and one look, you can tell Louis Vuitton bags are made out of one piece of leather. So one side of it is normal side up, the other side is upside down. Anyway, that's the easiest way to tell. All the bags I've seen from all these women or guys or whatever know quite well you can't afford it. Why are you going out there with your fake Louis Vuitton bags? Think about that for a second. Is it for you? Well, not really. Are you impressed other people? Yeah, why? I can, I can mention you 10 billionaires right now. I'm millionaires. You will not see Louis Vuitton bags. You'll see a bag from the store worth $10. You'll not see the late, latest Nike training shoes. What you'll see is a pair of sneakers you've probably never heard of. Why are you trying to impress people? How about impressing your family and God? How about that one? Yeah. You know, that's what I do. And then you stand out. Listen, I'm going to say something now that's going to freak you out. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It's not what bag you carry. It's who you hang around with. That's what the real deal is. Stop trying to impress someone. Impress yourself. Love yourself. Why do you want people to love you? You don't even love yourself when you walk around with fake stuff. Why? I know you want to be liked. Everybody does, but why? I'll tell you why. If you don't love yourself, that's why. Because you're not giving to the person on the corner or someone who needs. That's why. This is what it's about, you know? It's like, come on, guys, let's get real. Get in touch with yourself. You are very, very powerful. In fact, somebody said to me the other day, Rob, don't you find alcoholism an affliction? What? It's not an affliction. It's a superpower. Are you kidding me? I can work. I've saved people's lives on a daily basis. Six and a half thousand people, Emmett. Six and a half thousand people I've worked with all got well over a thirty-something year period. That's why. I'm, that's why I'm rich. I mean, yeah, I've got the stupid car worth hundred grand. I've got the big million dollar. I've got all of the toys yeah. that I can afford to buy. I'm not going out to buy a fake house so people think I live in a big house. It's, God, it's, it's money that God's given me that I can play with. But you know something? If it goes tomorrow, it makes no difference to me. Because you know what I have? I'd be surrounded by people who believe in me and vice versa and people that benefit from when I'm with them. And, and Do you need any more gifts than that? I don't think so. Hey, you know, you said something earlier that made me chuckle inside a little bit. He was like, I grew up in a trailer park. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I have this nice house in this nice Mayberry kind of town and I'm ready to chuck it all. 
and go buy a fifth wheel and a piece of land and decorate like little flowers around that fifth wheel, basically a trailer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. In this country, there is a negative connotation for living in a trailer. And over my life, I've, you know, this is my second marriage, but I started coming to this realization. I'm like, I'm paying for this house. This is right before 2008. I was just having this weird feeling. I'm like, you know, I never own this house outright. I may pay off the mortgage, but I always have to pay somebody to stay here. I'm like, that makes no sense. I was like, I need to find a place where I can just homestead, put something there, make enough so I can eat. I'll have the shelter and feel safe. Boom. And all my friends are just opposite. Yo, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. These mortgage rates are low. We're gonna double the size of our house. I'm like, your kids just graduated school. Why would you get a bigger house? I know. <laughs> it's all showing up. It's all look at me, look at me. You know, I, I always remember I spoke to Arnold some years later when he became famous, and we're talking about his Ferrari. He bought a Ferrari, and uh, he's talking about a similar life. And this guy came up to him with a I don't know, escort suits up this, that, or Japanese stuff next to him, his rest rev, and he couldn't see it was Arnold. And then the, the lights changed, and this guy put his foot down, and he was smoked him. And, and I was swear thing and drove off normally. And I said, I, I always talk about Arnold, what does that mean? And he said, it doesn't make any difference how big the car is or how fast you get there. So why don't you just enjoy the journey and stop worrying about showing off to other people? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow. Because everyone wants a destination. Get this, get that. If I get this, it'll make me happy. I, draw, I, I bought a car uh, four years ago, five years ago, and uh, it was a brand new car. It was a Porsche, and uh, I drove it home, and the next day I'm driving it to work, and it was great, and I loved it. And the day after, I was driving to work thinking, I wonder what the, the one up from this is. <laughs> what? That's how my mind is. Like, what if I get this? Well, that guy's got a Rolex. What if I get a Daytona? Ro- Stop. And, it, and I'm not saying, guys, I'm not sitting here preaching. And it took me years. In fact, only the last four or five years, I've realized that I've got nothing to prove to anybody anymore. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I did it all my life proving to people because of my illness and my disease, because of the imposter syndrome when I went to college, because I've always never loved myself. I never liked being inside my body. Like I, as a youngster, like my, my first couple of years outside college, Oxford University, uh, I, w- I was pretty wealthy. And I would, I would go to a nightclub and I would drive around that nightclub in my Bentley until a space in front of that nightclub claimed, became clear so I could park right in front of it. That might be 20 minutes, it might be 15 hours, but I keep driving around until I got a space in front of it. Then when I got out so everybody could see me, I'd walk in. Then I'd be flopped around by girls who'd seen this and they would ask me, Emma, at the time I ran a telecommunications company, and they would ask me, what do you do for a living? I told them I was an astronaut, I was a football player, I was an actor. I could never just say, hey, I own a million dollar company in telecoms. I always had to be somebody else. Yeah. And that's a sickness, damn it. That's not believing in myself, it's not loving myself, and it's the imposter syndrome. I'm never going to be good enough. So here's, here's four things for you guys. If you're out there and you think, you know, my God, you know, I want to be this one, of listen, why don't you just realize like me? You're never going to be blonde enough. You're never going to be tall enough. You're never going to be thin enough. And you're never going to be rich enough. And once you take that inside and run with that, your life will take off. Because we're always trying to prove to people. I'm trying to tie this together because I I feel it ties together, which is what we've been talking about. You know, the mindset as uh, the self-actualization of being a human being and drugs because there are some people who have a predisposition to addiction. Yes. There are others who fall into addiction where they don't have a predisposition, but if once they're exposed to it, their constitution won't let it go. Where does this stuff come from? You know, like, cause I remember when I was a kid, my mom was like, don't do drugs. Everybody I knew around me smoked weed. I mean, this is in the 70s and the 80s. Everybody smoked weed and they were highly functional. But I knew some heroin addicts who are dead now. Um, 
Yeah, because that was the thing. Before crack, it was heroin. And they're dead. Uh, Cocaine came on the scene. And you could always tell because they were (laughs) jerky and like, let's get it done and and sweating all the time. (laughs) But, you know, a a lot of those people were able to get off. But then they shrunk down the pot or concentrated the potency of cocaine and made crack cocaine. And then from there, these other things, because, you know, there is a definite pipeline. If you do this drug for so long, your market share is going to fall because you don't have customers. (laughs) So they come out with newer stuff because people are like crack is bad. I can't do that. Oh, but there's this other thing that's come out. It's not as bad or it tastes good. What, what is this? What keeps us on this train from people who were not predisposed to addiction, but people who become addicts? It gives a set of senses, Victoria, that nobody else has ever said to me in 30 years and probably 10 years of podcasting and uh, 12 years of TV. And I'm talking about the predisposition. There are some alcoholics that, that, that will drink day one with the hooks finished over or born this way. Then there's the guys that take the experiment with marijuana. Then they go on to something heavy. Then they go on to something. And they're always trying to chase the high of the first uh, drug, which is the first smoke ever of marijuana. They're chasing that feeling all the time. Now, you've got to look at circumstances around you. You've got to look at the way they were brought up. You know, it doesn't make a difference if you're rich or poor. It's, it's what's in the house that happens and how you brought up and the friends around you. But for most people... They, they, they keep chasing that first high and, and it never ends and what happens is the body and the main the brain are distorted uh, as they go from say ages 12 to, to 25 or something so that they're always chasing this and it will never stop and what happens in the head is we call neural pathways that's our thought patterns there are billions but we get a set of neural pathways that are self-destruction self-sabotage in your pathways and that's what it is it comes down to self-sabotage every time they think it's a high We have experiments to prove that wrong. When somebody goes to a a dealer to get some whatever it is, heroin, crack, uh, what's the most intoxicating part of that thought pattern? Get in the car, drive there, use, get back home. So there's there's four angles we can go from. The most intoxicating part of that is to drive there. Anticipation. The the anticipation of, oh, my God. So I was at a liquor store one morning, and Back in the day when I was drinking and freezing, and you know, I'm stood there. It's snowing outside at 5 30 in the morning. It's below freezing. I've got a tiny vest on, a pair of shorts, and a pair of flip flops in the snow. And I am sweating and shaking and banging head up because I'm going to go into DTs any second now. And if I don't get alcohol in my body, I'm probably going to die. That's how bad I was at the time. The shopkeeper opened the store in Manchester. He looked at me, he knew me, not supposed to sell alcohol till 10. It was 5.30 in the morning. I walked in, nobody's around. I give him my 10 pounds. He put the bottle of vodka on the counter and this. This is when I first realized. This was my reaction. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Sleep stopped. Shiver stopped. Sweating stopped. Now I'm in a great mood. Not even open the bottle. Just got my hand round the bottle. And it was then I realized that if I ever come off the streets... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the rest of my life understanding what this is about. Because the medical fraternities are still baffled about alcoholism and addiction. They, they'll send you to AA or NA or whatever. What's the real problem going on? Because if it's not the alcohol, what is it? Well, it's me. That's the problem. So remove the alcohol and the drugs away from me. What do you have? You still have me. You know, if the most intoxicating part of a, of a deal or a hit or whatever it is, is the journey there then we need to rethink alcoholism and addiction. And that's what I did. Yeah. You know, this, I, I believe you and I could have these discussions because of my background and what I've seen in life um, in my particular station, because I realized that often these things manifest out of trauma as well. You know, there's, yes. and we don't always, and we don't always, we think that it's trauma that's so overt, but not all trauma is overt. Some of it's so subconscious, like you're just in proximity to it, but it affects you to a degree where, you know, your psyche is cracked. I understand this. I understand it implicitly. But, you know, like I said, there's just so much that we could all talk about. And I commend you for the work that you're doing. And I want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast 
And I'm going to extend this to you. Let's give it less than 60 days and let's revisit this because I think there's more roads that we can go down to help the masses. So thank you for being on the show. Oh, no, absolutely my pleasure. You're an amazing guy. You do amazing work. I want to thank you for the hundreds of thousands of people out there, Emmett, that you affect. Because most of us don't know we do that, but you do. What you do is absolutely amazing. And people don't hear this. You know, I had a friend of mine, he, he did two, two of my nurses were in the, in, in the thing, and he saw me do some work with a patient. One of them said, he's amazing. The other girl said, I know, have you told him? Oh, oh, no, no, he already knows. Emmett, just in case you don't know, I want to tell you what an amazing job you do. What an amazing guy you are. And I hate you for being 50 and looking like 20. Oh, I'm... I... <laughs> You you, don't, you haven't even hit it. It's moving toward 55. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you so much, Emmett. You're a great guy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how we exit you. We are not gone forever. And as a matter of fact, with the podcast, I can be eternal. And I can always be in your consciousness. But I want you to realize something. Love starts with the self. So we're going to break it down in the cosmos kind of thing here. So I always say... As above, so below. So if you go out into space, you start to see these little dots, and these little dots are circling around another dot, which kind of looks like something familiar here on this plane. If you look at some gaseous modules that are out there, they kind of look like your iris. As above, so below. So let's start out in space. We're going to see these dots, and we're going to travel into this galaxy, which you see this swirl going around, something going around the nucleus. And then you hone in on this planet, and you see it swirling around another thing, which is our sun that gives us color and life. And then you get down, you see these little dots, and these dots are human beings. And you're like, uh. And then you go into that human being, and then you start to see those dots again. They're called cells. And the cells comprise the self. Because when your cells get hungry, that's what makes you eat. It's not you that are hungry. It's you have an ecosystem that you have to support. And then if you go down even further and you get into a cell, you see all these structures that have another universe. And then if you keep going down and if you get down low enough, you'll get back to that place that you originally saw, which was something circling something else. It's fractal. You are connected to everything. The next time you go by a lake or a body of water, I want you to go in, take your shoes off, and just stand there because that water is connected to everything on this planet. And so then when I go to the water and I stick my feet in, even if it's the bathtub, we are connected. Till next time, make sure you go to the mirror after the shower, drop your towel, and love the God body you were given. Look closely in in the mirror and say these words. I love you. Till next time, love you all. Peace.